then on the ground. Down here, bro, I guess people might have had late nights maybe. We didn't have to use the get people out of jail money, so that was a good. So we're zero for one. Let's try and make it zero for two for the whole country. You having good, good days today? Yes. Yes, wonderful. Right, I've just got a few notices for you, and then I might tell you a joke, if that's okay. <laughs> you don't have to laugh at the jokes if you don't want to. And then we'll get on to the keynote speaker. So we've got a, an arts festival that's starting tomorrow, and if you're staying after the conference, if you decide to stay on for the weekend, then there's a few discounted tickets available, and you can pick those up on the registration desk over at the Student Centre. There's a new session that wasn't included in the program. It's Rebecca Freeman is now going to be running two sessions back to back on Friday. Uh, the one that's entitled Keeping Peace with a Changing Future, Keeping Our Place in a Changing Classroom. And that additional session, if you want to make note of it, will take place at A309 from 11.50 to 12.15, and that's tomorrow. The A309, 11.50 to 12.15 tomorrow. And before I call up David, uh, I've also got another, another notice from someone. The Pecha Kucha workshop that's happening tomorrow, or no, this afternoon, sorry. And I know a few of you are going to it. And there's a challenge being put out for you to think for the rest of the day, what would you do with 400 seconds? If you had 400 seconds, what would you do with it? Because you might be asked this question later on. So my joke, what did the monster say after he ate the big G? I want some iron. It's my pleasure to wake, welcome up David Starrick, who's going to introduce our keynote speaker. And David is our flexible learning team leader here at MIT. Can you please give David a big round of applause? Many a year now about the way coming towards us uh, of open education. Well, we can be rest, rest assured that that way is a promise. So we're very fortunate to have someone at Wayne's International Standing to address this topic. Please welcome him to the stage. to share what we are doing in the open education space. The Open Education Resource University Initiative is an international collaboration of institutions around the world that are aiming to make education more affordable for all learners worldwide. Um, you'll notice that the OER University has a small U, and we're using the concept of university in its traditional sense of a community of scholars and learners uh, in the pursuit of knowledge and education. And what I mean by that is this is not an exclusive model. It's not 
and exclusive in the sense that it's only universities that are participating. You also have a number of polytechnics, institutes of technology, and community colleges uh, that are participating in the initiative. Um, just to clarify, I'm speaking with two hats today. Um, my hat at the OER uh, Foundation, as well as the Commonwealth of Learning Chair in Open Education Resources, which is based at uh, Otago Polytechnic. And you'll all be familiar with our Kiwi can do attitude of really using our resourcefulness in getting the job done. And in many respects, this is what is leading the Open Education Resource University Initiative, where we favor pragmatism above pretense. I want to recognize a number of outstanding pioneers. Otago Polytechnic, the University of Canterbury, NMIT, the Open Polytechnic and North Tech, which are founding and partners of the OER University Initiative. I should also mention ACRO, who are a strategic partner of the OER Foundation, and in fact, to the best of my knowledge, earlier this year, sponsored what is the largest free open online workshop on open education resources, copyright, and creative commons licenses. And we will be hosting a, so this is a free gift from the OER Foundation, another opportunity for all the educators in New Zealand to participate in one of these online workshops scheduled for the 3rd of December. So do come and join us. I'm not sure if there's any relevance in the fact that the number of institutions from the mainland outnumbers those from further north, but we can explore that a little further. This is the point where I usually give my standard health warning. And that is if you do suffer from hypertension, you best listen to me under parental guidance. <laughs> and the reason for this is I am a free software user. And if you're in the course of today's presentation, I do not get to mention your favorite proprietary software tool. Um, take a deep breath, relax, you'll be just fine. You see, the deal is, if you say to me, Wayne, that's the cool piece of software you are using, can I get a copy? I do not want to be faced with the ethical dilemma of refusing to help a friend in order to uphold the copyright provisions of closed source software. Speaking about the open source movement, I often reflect with our lead software engineer, Jim Titzler, who is an open source developer of Note. And one of the interesting anecdotal observations is that in the free software world, we only have a few rock stars. People like Richard Stallman, Lena Stolvalds, Eric Raymond, Bruce Perrins, and so on. But yet we have thousands of coders contributing to this great vision of free software. But yet, in the open education world, it seems to me that we have too many educators trying to be rock stars, as opposed to working at the heart of our education endeavor, and that is to share knowledge freely. I think the challenge we are faced in open education is crossing the chasm from sharing to learn, to learning to share. A little bit about the Open Education Resource Foundation. We are an independent, non-profit entity that provides a leadership, international networking, and support to education institutions to achieve their strategic objectives through the use of open educational resources. The definition I rather like of OERs are materials that are used to support education that may be freely accessed, reused and modified and shared by anyone. We administer two flagship initiatives at the OER Foundation. The Wiki Educator Project, uh, the vision of turning the digital divide into digital dividends. This is one of the largest collaborations of educators, of more than 40,000 educators worldwide who are collaborating in developing open education resources. Our second flagship initiative, of course, is the OER Tertiary Education Network, which is the driving force which is implementing the Open Education Resource University Initiative. 
the OER University collaboration will be able to accredit OER learning on five continents with a substantive foothold in 20 countries. And these are the institutions that are leading more affordable education futures. If there's one element that signifies a pragmatic approach, that is the sustainability of open education. And so the question is, how do we achieve sustainable OER projects? People like Stephen Downs have reflected on uh, this challenge, and there are a number of models which are used to try and generate the revenue to support open education approaches. But most open education projects tend to be add-ons to the core business of operations at our institutions. And that of itself creates a number of challenges. It is my belief that if we integrate open education processes as part of our core business, we will have a sustainable model. So I think the question we should rather be asking ourselves is how will your institution remain sustainable without OER? And just to prove that we are the competition on your doorstep, we have just released our first Open Education Resource University course, the prototype, which is a first year course in uh, international relations in Asia and the Pacific, which was developed by the University of Southern Queensland. But just a comparison of the tuition costs across the world. In the United States of America, a four-year bachelor's degree uh, will cost you in the region on average of 26,000 US dollars. At the top of Polytechnic, I've just extra extrapolated one of our cheapest degrees into a four-year degree program. That same qualification will cost you the equivalent of roughly about 19,000 US dollars. The offering the first offering at the, of the OER University for a total four-year degree at the current cost before we've implemented economies of scale will be just, well, just short of 7,000 US dollars. And so you can see that the model is capable of producing far more affordable education opportunities. And as the Vice Chancellor, Professor Jan Thomas of USQ indicates, with the OER University initiative, cost has been removed as a barrier to learning. I should stress first and foremost that the OER University Initiative is a philanthropic project. Our aim is to provide free learning opportunities to all students worldwide with opportunities and pathways to gain critical credentials. But it is smart philanthropy because the lessons we learn as participating institutions can be plowed back into our mainstream delivery models to make our education systems more efficient and more affordable. So how are we going about bootstrapping this initiative? And there are a few key features that are the reasons for our success. We have a compelling vision that is strongly aligned with the core values of education. And the vision of providing free learning for all citizens is definitely a compelling vision. We open source everything we do. All our technology infrastructure, our planning processes, our strategic planning is open sourced. We generate competitive advantage for our network partners. The partners who are part of our network are in a far better position than those standing outside of the network. We leverage the network effect and we have smart solutions for scalability because as this model grows through the FTE contributions from our institutions, staffing is taken care of. We minimize risk. The recurrent costs of participating in this network are recouped. They are guaranteed. But above all, we make sure that we do not innovate on too many fronts. If you want to ensure failure, make sure that you innovate beyond society's capacity to accept those innovations. So a little bit more about our model. I apologize for the slide, it's not that legible, but this is literally 
data which is part of the press. We conducted an international context evaluation for the Open Education Resource University and asked our partners for the reasons they are joining our network. And while all the reasons we listed are highly rated, the top three reasons why institutions join our network is first of all, to be part of an international network. Second, <coughs> our philanthropic mission in providing more affordable access to learning worldwide. And the third one is interesting, is to make sure that our institutions are involved in experimenting with new business models in open education. So it's quite interesting to see the rankings as to why institutions are joining our network. The value proposition is not rocket science. We believe that through the use of open education resources combined with open education practices, we can increase quality, widen access, and reduce cost by an order of magnitude. Thinking a little about the values of why open education is so important. You will all be familiar with the tragedy of the village dream, which was overgrazed at the expense of the community. My colleague, Professor Rory McGreal, the UNESCO Chair for OER, alerted me to this protest poem. They hang the man and flog the woman who steals the goose from off the car, but leave the greater villain who steals the common from off the goose. And to some extent, I think we in post-secondary education are a tad guilty of stealing the common from off the goose. And if we at the OER Foundation have seen into the future of education, it is only because we stand on the shoulders of giants. And I stole that line from a speech given by Evan Morgan in 2001. We stole that line from Isaac Newton. We stole that line from Reed Stephens. And we know this because the American sociologist Robert Burton referenced an anonymous note that was published in the British Journal. To put this in today's context, our first OERU course is on international relations in Asia and the Pacific, and one of the units deals with the history of the region. And for those of you with the knowledge of anthropology of the South Pacific, will be familiar with the, the Lapita uh, people who are the origins of culture in our, our region. And we know this because of Lapita pottery. Um, that particular artifact dates back to 1100 BC. And so what's interesting is the situation around copyright. The copyright of an image belongs to the photographer or the institution that's employing the photographer. That particular image is copyrighted to one of New Zealand's leading research institutions. But what is particularly interesting about this example, the origins of copyright through the Statute of Anne, an act that was uh, enacted in 1709, uh, and, and clearly the artifact itself could never have been copyright because copyright didn't exist until 1709. However, because the image of a public domain artifact is licensed to the copyright holder, I wrote to the copyright officer of the institution requesting permission to reuse the image under Creative Commons Attribution or Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike license. The response I received was an order form to purchase a single instance of that image at 150 US dollars. <laughs> My response to the institution was, I will source a photographer from the free culture to come and take a photograph of this artifact which is in the public domain. I never received a response. <laughs> but the story has a happy ending. One of our partners, the University of South Pacific, the former Deputy BC Research Professor Patrick Nunn, in fact directed one of the most significant digs of the Peter Pottery and found, uh, in fact, a jewelry box dating again to 1100, carbon dated to 1100 BC. I wrote to Patrick, I said, hey, 
We're in the business of sharing knowledge. Are you come, do you perhaps have any images of the future property we could use? And as a result, we now have a range of openly licensed images, which all of us are free to use in supporting education. But innovation and disruption in education is an interesting business. You will all be familiar with Kodachrome, which was in fact one of the world leaders in the sale of colorful photography. In 2009, Kodachrome ceased production. But what is interesting with this example is that the principles of photography have not changed, but the way we do it has. But my favorite example is that of the ice harvesting industry. The ice harvesting industry in the late 1800s was in fact one of the top three earners of gross domestic product in the United States of America. In the northern regions, ice would be hard harvested and exported around the world to cool boxes. We know the history, the invention of compressor-driven refrigeration, and as a result, I have no members of my family working in the ice harvesting industry. But what is particularly interesting is the discourse that takes place at the time of these disruptions. There were those arguing that the quality of the coal from authentic ice is superior, or was superior, to the quality of coal from artificial ice. And so, with, in the open education movement, we have our own red herrings. And as you well know, there is no such thing as a red herring. It is a kipper which has been cold smoked. <laughs> the first red herring is that if I open up my education resources, the sky is going to fall down in that we're going to lose students. There is no research evidence to indicate that institutions that open up their courses by using OER will lose students. The second red herring, of course, is the quality red herring. Um, and I put it to you, if we, the educators, are responsible for developing these resources, who are we going to blame for poor quality? And so I put the question to educators worldwide. This is a survey which is more than 700 educators, and we asked educators to, uh, to indicate the level of agreement with the following statement. Um, you know, I'm reluctant to use teaching materials and creative works generated by other authors because there's no guarantee of quality. And of course, the majority of educators disagree with that statement. And the reason for that is, as educators, we are intelligent agents and we can discern quality. Remember I said that we should never innovate beyond society's capacity to accept the innovation. 150 years ago, the University of London, through the External Studies Program, initiated an examination only model. And what the University of London said is, we don't care where you acquire your learning, but if you can pass the University of London exam, you will earn a University of London degree. This initiative has produced five Nobel laureates, if you're concerned about quality. And so the OER University concept is not that radical. We will provide free learning opportunities to all students worldwide using courses that are based entirely on open education resources. Through the intelligent design of a system of academic volunteer support, you can see it is quite possible that our member institutions can provide assessment and credentialing services on a cost recovery basis for these learners on their pathways to achieving credible degrees. <clears throat> a little bit about the drivers and context underpinning the model in terms of the unsatisfied demand we have and the cost behaviors that underpin the open education resource movement. Researchers at UNESCO and the Commonwealth of Learning conservatively predict that we need to provide an additional 100 million places for post-secondary education, an additional 100 million places, roughly over the next 15 years. 
And you can do the mental math around that. It's the equivalent of building four sizable institutions of 30,000 students each every week for the next 15 years. You and I know that the traditional model is not going to be able to deliver on that demand. What about the cost behaviors? You know, how much is this going to cost? And who is going to pay for it? So let's look at the basics, economic drivers at an operational level. The marginal cost of replicating digital knowledge is near zero. <coughs> Given those cross behaviors, why would we want to deny access to those learners who can't afford it? The second fundamental principle, and this is not rocket science, if 10 institutions collaborate together on the development of a high quality course using OERs, it's far cheaper than doing it alone. And with those two cost drivers, we can build a system which is of order of magnitude more efficient than the traditional closed model. So what have we got so far to build this model? We have literally thousands of courses that are available for the Open Course We Initiative. We have well over 5,000 journals that are open, openly available as open access. We have a growing inventory of open education resources and experiences in open education practices to build this model. And we have more than 70 years of organizational experience in the practice of distance education in figuring out how do we provide assessment remotely. At our institutions, we have the existing policy protocols that will enable the model to work. In particular, those institutions that have advanced academic prior learning policies uh, within their models. And so it is indeed feasible that we can provide free learning opportunities for all students worldwide. And a little bit of history in terms of how this came into being. I was speaking at an event uh, late in 2010 where Professor Jim Taylor from the University of Southern Queensland was also speaking on open scholarship. And clearly, our ideas in terms of what we were wanting to achieve were very similar. And I had a chat with Jim, and we said, well, OK, let's call a meeting. And whoever comes to that meeting, we start planning the concept. And so on the 23rd of February, and I remember that day clearly, because it was the day after the earthquake in Christchurch. And a number of people, of course, were delayed because of transit issues. But we organized a meeting, and with funding support from UNESCO, we were able to stream the meeting worldwide. And at this meeting, we tested the concept of what we call a logic model for designing this OER University initiative. And basically, the model looks something like this. There are a number of services where it would make more sense for our institutions to be collaborating together. To be collaborating on things like open curriculum, open design and development, open pedagogy, and a volunteer system of student support. There are a number of things where it makes better sense for our individual institutions to be providing those services. Things like the credentialing services. There are a number of areas where it makes sense to share infrastructure. Things like the ICT infrastructure that will be providing access to all these learners. And so there are a wide range of services we could be providing at no cost. But there's one important foundation we will not compromise, and that is the quality of credentials. There will be parity of esteem between credentials earned through the OER University network and those equivalents on campus. The next step after convening that meeting was to achieve a critical mass of anchor partners who would take this forward, and I'm sure you would agree with me, we do have the critical mass of anchor partners, including some of the world's leading institutions in open distance learning. Our own Open Polytechnic, uh, Athabasca University's premier online university, um, which is Canada's premier online university, Empire State College, who are pioneers 
of the individualized study curriculum. The Open University of Catalonia, which is the world's first e-learning university, and so on. Particularly important with our region, of course, is the University of South Pacific, which has a foothold, of course, in 12 of the um, small island uh, states in our region. We then convened the meeting of our first founding anchor partners in November. So think about this. February we had the idea, November we convened the meeting to plan how to take this forward. And what we agreed among our anchor partners is that the normal credential will be a Bachelor of General Studies. We are prototyping courses to 2012, and our first one will in fact be running shortly. And we're targeting the formal launch of the OER in 2013. And you can mark that date, the official launch date will be the 7th of November 2013. This provides an interesting perspective on the differences between the traditional model and the OER university model. And these ideas I, uh, come from uh, Judith Murray, who was formerly at Thompson Rivers Open University. Under the traditional model, your academics are teaching your courses to your students to achieve your credential, right? Under the OER view model, <laughs> We were actually going to be able to have any academic volunteers from around the world who will be able to use any OER materials to any students who want to learn through this methodology to achieve your credentials. So those are the fundamental differences. As I said, everything that we do is open sourced, and even our planning meetings are streamed openly to anybody in the world who wants to help build these futures. And we use a number of technologies with feedback channels to enable and facilitate this open planning process. And I shall give you a few illustrations of that. So what are the rules of this OER University game? Our OER tertiary education network partners agree that they will credential OER learners at a price which they determine. And most of our partners will be doing this on a cross country basis. Each of our partners agreed to assemble a minimum of two courses from existing OERs. Some institutions will be doing more, but there's no expectation from any of our partners to do more. And now you can think of the scalability of the model of 20 institutions, you know, kind of that's 38 courses you get in return for your contribution of two. That's a pretty good deal. Our partners will agree to maximize, insofar as possible, with local uh, credentialing policies, uh, the articulation and credit transfer within the network. And of course, each of our partners are gold and silver members of the OER Foundation, which provides revenue streams to support the central infrastructure of this global collaboration. What are the mechanics of our operation? The OER University Network does not confer degrees. The individual institutions who are, who are our partners do. Our OER University partners retain their decision-making autonomy. They determine the price they will charge for assessment and credentialing services. Institutions will operate within their local matriculation requirements. So, for example, some of our institutions have higher demands for matriculation in terms of the number of courses they need to complete at that institution in order to get a degree from that institution. Other institutions, like at the Basque University, who are part of our network, have a far more liberal approach. You only need to essentially take one course at the Basque University uh, and you can transfer all your other credits in in order to get an, an Athabasca University degree. A very significant feature of the OER University model is we do not expect any of our anchor partners to change institutional policies. In other words, that they operate within existing policies. Now obviously those institutions that have more progressive policies for recognition of prior learning are of course well, <coughs> well suited 
to the model. But there are interesting challenges with the conventional uh, recognition of prior learning model, which is based on portfolio assessment largely. It's an expensive model and it's difficult to scale. But what we are able to do with the OER University Network is to implement course-based portfolios which will be able to scale in a cost. So basically what you can see here, this is the full OER logic model. All the activities we execute in order to implement the plan are conducted openly in the wiki. And so as I've said, I extend an open invitation to all of you to assist us with our planning. We develop our course materials to learn with you. That's just a screenshot of uh, the first course which is going live within the next couple of weeks. One of the affordances that Wiki technology enables us is that we can have a central detailed version of history and can produce the, uh, outputs for multiple delivery formats. We can automatically generate print-based study guides. We can quite easily integrate it the technology into any learning management system or any website for that matter. And if you wanted to use a blog, for example, to deliver your courses, you would be able to do so. A little bit in terms of how we distribute the processing power and collaboration across the internet. For those of you that have been watching MOOC space, you'll see a number of MOOC-like features that are embedded in our model. Our learning resources are developed centrally in the Wiki Educator. Uh, they can be integrated into any uh, learning management system. Uh, we make use of a community-based uh, question and answer forum, which provides a level of peer learning support in terms of the learning resources. We distribute our interactions across the internet using microblogs, including Twitter, Identica, forum posts, blog posts, and we are able to aggregate the RSS feeds into a central timeline. So we can aggregate processing power across the web. That's more or less how the, the model is put together. Uh, that's just a screenshot which illustrates an aggregated timeline of you know, posts coming from various sources, discussion forums, blog posts, uh, you know, microblog posts. In, in wrapping up, we believe we have a solution to sustainable innovation. No new money is required by our institutions. The recurrent cost is recouped. The OER University Initiative is low cost, low-less, but high-impact innovation. We are providing free learning to all students worldwide, with pathways for these learners to gain credible credentials. And as Jim has pointed out, it's not theoretical speculation. It's happening right now. And I extend an open invitation to all of you to come and join us. This is not an exclusive club. I thank you for your attention, and I hope there are a few challenging questions. Thank you very much. So basically what you can see here, this is the full OER logic model. All the activities we execute in order to implement the plan are conducted openly in the wiki. And so as I've said, I extend an open invitation to all of you to assist us with our planning. We develop our course materials to learn with you. That's just a screenshot of uh, the first course which is going live within the next couple of weeks. One of the affordances that Wiki technology enables us is that we can have a central detailed version of history and can produce the, uh, outputs for multiple delivery formats. We can automatically generate print-based study guides. We can quite easily integrate the, the technology into any learning management system or any website for that matter. And if you wanted to use a blog, for example, to deliver your courses, you would be able to do so. A little bit in terms of how we distribute the processing power and collaboration across the internet. For those of you that have been watching MOOC space, you'll see a number of MOOC-like features that are embedded in our model. Our learning resources are developed centrally in the Wiki Educator. 
Uh, they can be integrated into any uh, learning management system. Uh, we make use of a community-based uh, question and answer forum, which provides a level of peer learning support in terms of the learning resources. We distribute our interactions across the internet using microblogs, including Twitter, Identica, forum posts, blog posts, and we are able to aggregate the RSS feeds into a central timeline. So we can aggregate posts in power across the web. That's more or less how the, the model is put together. Uh, that's just a screenshot which illustrates an aggregated timeline of you know, posts coming from various sources, discussion forums, blog posts. Uh, you know, posts. In, in wrapping up, we believe we have a solution to sustainable innovation. No new money is required by our institutions. The recurrent cost is recouped. The OER University Initiative is low cost, lowness, but high impact innovation. We are providing free learning to all students worldwide with pathways for these learners to gain credible credentials. And as Jim has pointed out, it's not theoretical speculation. It's happening right now. And I extend an open invitation to all of you to come and join us. This is not an exclusive club. I thank you for your attention and I hope there are a few challenging questions. Thank you very much. Hi, does anyone have any does anyone have any questions? The question is, um, for the benefit of those who didn't hear, is the question uh, of multilingualism and other languages within the network. Uh, this, uh, where we stand at, uh, at this point of our journey, as OER and your anchor partners, we haven't taken a decision against accommodating other languages. However, at this time, we are uh, predominantly focused on, you know, on English, uh, and the reason for that is, you know, you will appreciate it, it's an innovative model. Um, and we do not want to add a layer of complexity at this time of our journey in order to you know, get the prototypes completed. But that said, we already have the University of Catalonia, which is you know, a Spanish medium institution. And there are another, a number of prospective members that teach through the medium of other uh, languages um, that are interested in joining us. And I guess the central question for us at the OER University among our partners is we haven't really thought through the ideal solution. And, and there are potentially a number of models. One model is to say, well, okay, different languages should establish their own networks, uh, reusing our you know, model uh, for different languages. Um, the other option, of course, is for us across languages to be collaborating together to figure out which components we can use. But to be honest, as, as a network, we haven't taken final decisions there. I'm kind of interested that you've taken quite a traditional approach to your first offering. Yes. You've come together as a basically an academic board and said, here is the structure and the degree, yep. take it or leave it. Yep. Rather than a ground up uh, approach of communities coming together and saying, out of everything these institutions offer, is there sufficient interest yep. for a, a sufficient interest for a community of learners to come together yep. and subscribe to one of the offerings of an institution? Yep. Is there a reason behind that? Um, it's, it's a very valid question. Uh, in, in, in summary, uh, the OER University has taken a very traditional model, which tends to be cohort based, and the partners have kind of decided what the offerings would be, as opposed to a more open and flexible approach kind of grassroots where learners are uh, determined curriculum and you know, moving forward. Uh, the reason we've adopted and, and moving with this approach is, is really this challenge of not innovating beyond society's capacity to accept the innovations. And that's not a value judgment. 
against the importance of open community models and how the evidence source can piece off with that. Um, but it's, it's really about the perception of the quality of the credential. What is mission critical within this network and that we will not compromise within this network are the perceptions around the quality of the credential. As I said, there has to be parity of esteem. And in order to have the trust of society and the economy, there need to be those linkages between what is perceived to be a university credential. Yeah, but, even, but even within that model, there's quite a lot of flexibility in the curriculum. So if you go and look at the, the first prototype, how the course is actually based is on Jimmy Sammons' thinking of the utilities. And what the learners are actually going to do is they're actually going to navigate and find the own OERs in relation to the own learning interests. Right. So, so there's a bit of a mix there, but it's within the, the formal parameters of the university. But I should also maybe just mention our, our network is not attempting to replicate or work in areas where others are, are better at doing it. And so, for example, within the informal sector, the peer to peer university is filling a very, very important space around informal learning. Um, what we are doing is we're saying, well, this is our contribution as you know, formal education institutions. I suspect in time we're going to see some interesting synergies develop here. Now, I'm not going to suggest you go totally to the community and check up your own qualifications, but where you've got sufficient interest, say, for a, to do an engineering qualification, yep. for that to come forward and then yep. Yep. the partners say, well, what is, who are okay. engineering and that's what we're going to help yep. um, The network would respond to that quite easily. Um, the partners decide you know, which credentials come forward. So any community could actually come forward and say, hey, we want to do an engineering degree, right? Um, and move forward. So the decision here is that that's our starting point. Uh, the Bachelor of uh, Generals, and the reason we took it is you know, it's kind of obvious, uh, because I mean, you appreciate it, in the real world there are healthy dynamics on campus, and you know, trying to convince a faculty member who wants to remain close in perpetuity to contribute to course is kind of going to be hard. So we want to work with the champions, we want to work with people that move forward, and the Bachelor of General Studies provides as a starting point, considerable flexibility, you know, taking the first steps. Yep. I've got a question. Oh, sorry. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm not going to answer that question. I'm going to ask you an MIT to answer the question. I mean, Beyond altruism, I don't know, why did MIT think about this? Could you repeat the question? I couldn't quite catch What is the reason for you know, institutes have joined beyond altruism? Uh, and the example was given, I mean, for example, why did M MIT you know, join the partnership? It yeah. was altruism. Yeah, I mean, for me, uh, that 100 million people out there who can't access HE, for me, is, it says it all. Uh, but a question that, 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 I, that we wrestle with now uh, in, in all these new developments is, is how we manage the legacy model within an organisation and move with these great new initiatives. Yep. And I just wonder whether you had some, some guidance from your experience at Otago in moving forward on that. So, so the question is, how, how do we move to the new model uh, given the legacy that exists on campus. Given the pressures on, on, on the institution, yeah. I mean, we, we're, we're a gold member, yep. and we've put resources in, which we're delighted to do, um, but it's going to be a challenge for us to yep. expand. Yeah. So, so the approach that we've certainly been taking at Otago Polytechnic is, is really this pragmatic, can-do sort of Kiwi approach. Rather than necessarily trying to transform the whole organisation, is to have a look at you know, two, three, four, or you know, six courses where it makes sense for us to do this um, and that we have the staff that are passionate about making this happen. And in that way, we have, we've been able to move forward. In fact, our new graduate diploma in tertiary learning and teaching will be developed entirely as OER and will be part of this OER University Network. And, and, and so the Target Polytechnic's contribution will be significantly higher than the minimum two-course contribution. But I mean, why this 
model works is, you know, because we've got so many institutions, we're leveraging the network effect. So we're keeping the barriers of entry and the thresholds low. And it's really a question of, you know, organization, organizational capability development. It's not going to happen overnight. But we need to take it one step at a time. And the power of the open development model is that we gain experience while we're doing it and, and, and meet people where they are at within the model. <coughs> I mean, it's working well at Otago Poly, uh, moving forward. Um, but, you know, being realistic, I'm going to take it one step at a time. Um, you, you had a model there where you looked at traditional and then sort of the OER model. Yeah. I'm just wondering how you might summarise the changing role of the tutor in that process. It's, it's a very good question. Um, I mean, one of the red herrings kind of in this world is the fear of educators and tutors losing their jobs. I mean, let's be quite candid about it. Um, but if you go and look at those numbers of 100 million learners, if anything, we need to triple the workforce, you know, to be able to you know, stop dealing with the challenges. And I don't, I mean, I, I don't think there's any risk uh, for educators, you know, losing their jobs. Uh, as an example with the Code of uh, I think we are going to see changes in the way we operate within our institutions. Um, I mean, many of our institutions have built their pedagogical models around the competitiveness of the content which they're teaching. Um, so it's, it's, in the past, it's very much been a content-driven model. Um, but if you think of the pragmatics of this, content is everywhere. Uh, it's available there on the net. And it's really how the role of the educator will be shifting you know, to that of facilitating um, this process of learning through resources that are freely available you know, across the internet. So I mean, everything we've been talking about in terms of the sort of learning set of pedagogies and you know, uh, shifting from the set you know, the set on the stage, all those you know, good principles we've been advocating in need learning for so long are the principles that will ensure success uh, in this model. Um, as I, in the beginning, I, I said I think there'd be challenges for us to start learning how to share. Um, it's, it's a big challenge. We as educators are not good at sharing. Um, and, and granted, sharing is not easy. Uh, but I think it's one of the skills we as teachers are going to have to learn. I mean, I mean, speaking from an open source perspective, you know, if ever we start developing new code, the very first thing we're going to do is go and see what code already exists that we can reuse. Whereas as teachers, when, I, when, when I'm designing new learning sequence, the majority of teachers don't first go and look to find what's already available. They tend to start creating their own. So I think you know, that's part of the whole idea of learning to share. And to be honest, it's more fun doing it that way. You know, get to meet a bunch of new people. And, you know, the, the job becomes so much more rewarding. Yeah. Wayne, that, that, that's an important point there, that um, all the content the resources that are coming out of this, you don't need to be a partner to be utilising those resources yep. online in your own teaching practice and your own Absolutely. resources. So you don't all this is not necessarily about having to join the movement to produce content yourself. It's about participating and then reciprocity potentially coming out of that. Yep. And, and that's the power of the movement. Um, it's, you know, it's very much built on the open source software model. Um, the part that we are doing as the network is we create for ourselves as partners of the network a level of competitive advantage that people that aren't part of this network will, are, are not able to replicate. And so the very pragmatic level is just the technology infrastructure uh, you know, to carry this you know, teaching you know, to a million learners a single institution will not be able to set up and replicate that infrastructure. And so but working together we can. And, and, and so that's kind of where the value comes in. But it's a very good point. You don't have to be a member of the OER Foundation in order to reap benefits from the open education resource. <coughs> and in fact, we at the OER Foundation will help you achieve that. Yep, uh, uh, where, where the figures uh, come from is from all the UNESCO statistics, uh, looking at growth population projections within the 80 to 24 cohort. 
um, and, and the predictions are conservative. I mean, you could do even I mean, more kind of broader figures and, and say, well, okay, within the population cohort, you expect uh, the gross enrollment ratio to increase to, say, 20% on average, uh, you know, across the world. And you would see a far bigger figure than 100 million. But, but the range, I mean, you're absolutely right. There are so many unemployed graduates, but you know, whether, whether that's a problem of education or another set of issues and, and, and problems, you know, I'm not entirely sure. And I, I guess the question that you're asking ourselves is, you know, are, are we preparing our learners for these futures where, you know, you know you're not going to kind of get traditional jobs in the traditional sense anymore? You know? yeah. Did, Sorry. Oh. I don't know what's going on. the last comment around the um, change in bonds, you don't even work in relation to the employer's decisions for the bonds. Uh, the answer to the question, no, we haven't done uh, any research work uh, regarding employers' perceptions about what we're doing. Uh, but by the same token, uh, and I don't mean to be facetious uh, through my comment, I don't think we need to. Uh, because you must remember the credential that the learner is going to earn will be an NMIT credential. And employers respect NMIT's credential. Um, and, and so this is why we need to ensure parity of esteem. Um, it's kind of like asking, I don't think employers necessarily ask what textbook did you learn from in order to get your, you know, your degree. So basically what we're saying is you, know, you, you can learn from a variety of sources, but at the end of the day, you know, for learning outcomes, the competencies which you demonstrate, which will be properly evaluated with rigor. So um, I, I don't think it's, it's you know, as, as big a challenge as what we perceive it to be. I mean, there's a total polytechnic we uh, are progressing uh, quite aggressively with you know, work-based learning models. Um, so that relationship between the industry and what we're doing is strong. Well, I just want to make a comment that, and then I'll just give you a question. But also, there's not just an assumption this is all about fully online learning. The, Resources could be reused for blended learning or other sorts oh, of absolutely. Other, other ways. Right? Absolutely. And, and that's the payback of the model. You see, and that's why I said it's smart philanthropy. The things that we're developing in terms of resources and courses for the OER University can be ploughed right back into on campus delivery. And that's the, the real value proposition for individual organisations. And, and taking a step back, if you think of this from the OER Foundation's perspective, our mission in life is to ensure that every institution in the, on the planet migrates to open education resource models. So, in fact, we, have, we would love you all to use everything we produce and help us to produce it. There was a question at the back that's been waiting for quite some time. Uh, yeah, we're really worried about the economics. So, although the idea is Because we will take that students. I want to make it very clear that I support completely this thing. But I also want, would like to point out that I've been trying for the last five years to access some OER resources that one of your partners produced. And I'm having a shit of a Contact me after. You see, we want to use it and we want to show them to other teachers. Yeah. The, the issue might be, I mean, irrespective of, what the, irrespective of who the partner is, 
what you are perceiving to be OER at that partner may not be an OER resource. So in other words, so what is the license? I mean, if that is carrying a Creative Commons attribution or Creative Commons attribution share alike license, um, use it. You don't have to ask the permission. I'll talk to you. Yeah. But I'll, I'll try and help you solve the problem. Yeah. I'll try and help you solve the problem. Yeah. Right. David, could you shoot the microphone, please? Yeah. Oh, uh, I just have a quick question about how you see uh, practical components of programs and courses fitting in this uh, um, model. It's 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 a very it's a very good question. How do we deal with the practical components? Uh, let me put it to you this way: I don't want to be operated on by a surgeon that is studied entirely through this model. <laughs> um, we have to be realistic. There will be a number of disciplines and a number of you know, competencies which cannot be as you know taught or adequately assessed through this model, and we wouldn't do it. And it's, so that's where the blended provision um, you know comes into being. Yeah. Um, I, have a, I have a question um, that relates to yesterday's keynote speaking. Um, I'm really excited by the concept that you've shared, so thank you, and I, um, I'm actually quite technologically challenged as a tutor, sort of from the old world almost, so it's very, it presents a lot of um, interest and challenge to me. But my question relates to yesterday's keynote speak, which is more of a philosophical one. There was a talk about the colonisation of the mind um, in the keynote speech yesterday and how education is colluded with that in terms of the dominant story and the move towards credentialising and that that's actually quite a manipulative process and it seems to kind of contrast with the de democratic process that you've introduced but I'm just wondering have you considered whether this, how this model sits alongside the idea of the colonisation of the mind? A brilliant question. Uh, if, anything, <laughs> if anything, the risks of neo-colonialism or colonisation of the mind with this model is an order of magnitude less than the traditional model. And the reason for that being is the licensing frameworks that we use. We give every user and every learner the freedom to adapt, modify, change, do anything with these materials without restriction. And so if the colonization of the mind is a risk, and it is a substantive risk, then who are we going to you know, blame for the problem? And that of itself will be a learning experience, in my view. Particularly when you have the freedom to adapt and modify. And what about the credentialising, uh, you know, the fact that you have to have a higher and higher level of qualification to do a job that may not match that? It's, uh, um, it, it's a basic economic question as well, over and above a philosophical question. Um, I think the value, of the, the value of the credential is determined, or the total value of the credential is determined by what economy and society deem necessary. And, and, and you're right, I mean, you can go look at, across history how um, the demands for high level of qualifications have increased for relatively uh, sort of low level jobs, so to speak. Um, but I think education.